Hi again, welcome back to my channel. My name is Luke Carquia. I am a commercial DP and colorist living in New York. And today we're gonna to be talking about the Module 8 tuner, which when released, I actually kind of thought it was a bit of a gimmick, but in practice, it's pretty cool. So let's take a look at the engineering of the Module 8. Basically, it's an adapter with a lens element emulating that of a Baltzar or a K35. The tuning comes from the outer dial which actually moves that element further and closer away from the taking lens. It's reminiscent of anamorphic adapters they'd put on the front with a taking lens but reversed. Being at the back of the lens, this changes the characteristics of your taking lens dramatically. Now most of their adapters actually favor the edges, giving more of that character while the center stays pretty sharp while just introducing some diffusion when you turn the tuner up as high as you possibly can. So Module 8 has three different options to choose from. They have the L1, which is the Baltzar version. They have the L2, which is the K35 emulation. And the L3, which is the Retroscope, which is more of a, the anamorphic style you would get from vintage anamorphics. So which tuner you choose is completely up to you. And all the YouTube videos I've been watching for and reviewers, I've noticed that although they would review all three of them, they pretty much all preferred the L2 more than anything else, mostly because it was the cleanest one. It was just a little softer with even flaring and that K35 style bokeh that everyone loves. For me though, when picking this, I was deliberating for days on trying to figure out which one to exactly get. And I ended up going with the L1, which is known as the strongest one of the three that they make. But the reason I got the strongest one is because it's a tuner. I could just dial it back if I want to. For example, I'm actually using the L1 tuner right now and I'm dialed all the way back, which is pretty fine. And I'm at a 1.8. I could dial all the way up if I want to and get that really extreme effect at a 1.8. For me, this effect is super extreme, but cranking it up to 10 works really well when I want to deepen my depth of field, just like this. Now I'm at 2.5, which the deeper the depth of field, the more it lessens the effect. And because I can just turn up the tuner now, I still get that depth of field with all of the, you know, beautiful Baltzar look. So this is not a review unit of any kind. I actually bought this with my hard earned cash. The reason I bought it is because I had a job coming up that was actually for crowdfunding. So this was going to be shooting everything to get more crowdfunding to be able to make the actual uh, long form film. That being said, uh, it was a series of interviews and B-roll and whatnot. Basically because there was not really any budget, I was gonna be there alone. And I was gonna have my AC, I was gonna have a B-cam guy, so I was trying to find a way to give it a really specific look and be able to use like vintage lenses while still having the convenience of autofocus because when we're doing stuff on the gimbal or even during the interviews, uh, stuff like this, it's really nice to have that face tracking. So trying to figure things out, I actually remembered the Module 8 review I saw from Cine Daily's channel, and then I started looking into it a little bit more. Started to look in actually at the L3, and then the L2, which I knew I didn't really want, and then I ended up picking the L1. The idea was to use this combined with my Sigma Art Primes to be able to have a clean look and then have a vintage look that I can increase and decrease throughout the shoot. 
So when I received the L1 tuner, I took it out on a camping trip with my Red Komodo here, and then I used it with my Sigma Art Primes, which is what I've been pairing it with mostly, mainly because I can still utilize the autofocus of these on cameras like my C70 right here. Immediately, I noticed how strong this was. I mean, the Baltzars that this is emulating are very creamy on the edges, and all the highlights flare very easily, while still like giving this weird but cool vignetting effect. Uh, to the center of the frame, but not like actually vignetting, but just like the way the focus actually works in it, which is really cool. This, I assume, is why a lot of people went for the L2, because this thing is very, very strong, but I got it because I can tune it. There's a truck outside again. <laughs> The reason I got this is, well, because it is a tuner in more ways than just the dial on the system itself. It's also affected by the aperture you pick. The more wide open the lens, the more the effect is present. The more closed down the lens, the less the effect has. And for me, I'm not really a guy who shoots wide open on lenses all the time. I mean, I'm usually at like a four, five, six, and I get that because I like to see the depth of things. You know, the Baltzars these are emulating just based off of the extreme effect on a lens wide open. You know, these lenses were used to create movies like The Godfather and they don't look crazy in The Godfather. And that's because in bigger Hollywood movies, they don't actually shoot like wide open all the time. The only reason they're actually shooting wide open is to be able to let more light in or for a very desired effect. But most of the time movies are shooting at like a four, five, six because they can get the depth because they have all that design in there and they have enough light in the room for everything to be believable. So they don't just try and hide it. So for me, I really like it shooting at a four or a five, six and then putting the tuner at a full 10 gives me this really nice effect that I find pleasing that I actually would use on a lot of commercial work. It's really just the sweet spot for me. Overall, I really appreciate the look of this and I could see using different lenses with this, but right now I really think the Sigma's paired the best with it. All right, so one really neat trick I actually found out with this while I was shooting around the campfire with the Komodo was I was swapping lenses while the camera was on, but I wasn't really looking at my screen while I was doing it. But at one point I caught it when I was pointed directly at the campfire and it created this insane swirl effect because essentially this adapter is a lens inside of it. So it's similar to lens whacking, but keeping the lens as close as possible to the sensor. And it was just the coolest thing. I don't know how often I would use it. I'm using it for all of my title cards right now. But you know, if you wanna be Christopher Nolan and do some practical effects, this is the thing to buy. So as I've mentioned, I've been using this with my Sigma Art Primes as my taking lens primarily. But if you're using lenses that pretty much are like a 2.8 at their fastest, the effect is gonna be a lot more subtle, which I really do like. And if you're using extreme wide lenses or 100 millimeter and up, I notice the effect also becomes a little more subtle as well. So you're probably wondering what the cons of this whole system are. Well. Although I do really love it, there actually are a couple of them. One of them really being the price. Well, sort of. These things come in at a pretty high price tag, which I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's about here. My issue really is that there's adapters. So basically, if you want to mount an EF lens onto the cameras, you have the options of an E mount and R mount. But if you want to mount an EF lens to the Fuji camera, well, you can't because they only make a PL version of that one. The PL version is also for the RF, the L mount, and the E mount, and the X mount. I don't know why there's not an EF mount version for the X mount. It doesn't really make any sense to me. But what would make the most sense to me is to have whichever version of mount you want and then be able to change that from EF to PL. Like sell a kit with shims or something. Just like anything else, my old C300 Mark II, I had to buy a PL mount and I had to just shim it. And that just is a user swappable thing, even though it takes time. Like even if it takes some time, it'd be nice to be able to do. And speaking to the user swappability, I think these adapters would be a lot more popular if you could buy one adapter that's for lens to mount and be able to choose different L1, L2, L3 glass on the inside and make that user swappable as well. Like make each piece of glass a $350, $500 piece of glass and make that user swappable because the mechanism to move it further and closer from the lens is the same between all of the adapters. 
So that's kind of my con, and that's really it. So my con isn't really that there is a con with the system I'm using, I just really wish price-wise this made a little more sense because these are so expensive that a lot of people aren't just gonna go buying them. All that being said, I really do love my tuner and I think I'm gonna continuously be using it. I mean, I think Module 8 didn't really catch on so quickly, but they are ahead of their time. I mean, there is another project called the V35 project right now, which is taking Canon lenses and Sigma Cine lenses, both Cines, and they are, instead of rehousing things, because these are modern cinema lenses, they're detuning them, which is exactly what the Module 8 system is doing. The thing is, with their detuning, you have to send them in, have the lenses detuned, and they could be reversed, but they have to be sent in to be reversed as well. So that's where the Module 8 kind of has that step above on them. So what do you think? Are you going to use a Module 8 tuner on your next project? Comment below, let me know what you thought of this review, and subscribe and like, it really helps everything out. Thanks for watching, I can't wait to see you next time, but in the meantime, take a look at one of the two previous videos I put out recently.